All right, so I'm Anthony. Uh, I'm a physician assistant, uh, a graduate of the Toronto program from 2018. Um, part of, you know, the PE profession's goal is to, you know, increase access to care to areas that, you know, it's not already there. Uh, so I really wanted to bring that to Ottawa. You know, Ottawa is a big centre with lots of resources, but there are still patient groups that, you know, don't have the same access to care as everyone else or, you know, have, have been stigmatised if they don't want to access that care at all. Um, so I reached out to one of my physician colleagues uh, from when I was a clerk who works for an organisation um, in downtown Ottawa that deals with, uh, you know, increasing access to care to these individuals. And I said, hey, you know, I'm looking to get into this work um, just looking to do it on a casual status. I was originally going to do it on top of what I was already doing in neurosurgery, but just on the side. Um, she introduced me to uh, a lady who's also a nurse who, who, who runs this program for a bunch of clinics in downtown Ottawa for addictions and uh, mental health services. And uh, as I was talking to this nurse who ran this program, and I said, hey, you know, this is, a, this is the profession. This is what we can do. This is how I think it could work in this program for you. Uh, she fell in love with the position. Um, they previously had another advanced practice provider working there um, and they found that the PA profession was a bit more of a better fit just in the way that we're trained. Um, so she took on me as a, as a project and she, you know, she said, you know, I, I want you to come work for us full time. Are you able to, to come in and, and be the resource and build a profession here? And I decided to make the switch. And for those that aren't familiar with what addictions and mental health involves, how would you describe that specialty? So I do a bit of both. Uh, the main goal for me entering this clinic was to introduce primary care. Uh, they do a lot of needs assessments within the, within the different communities and different areas in Ottawa. And they found that one of the big gaps for individuals accessing mental health services was uh, access to primary care as well. So the, the goal of me entering that clinic was to do primarily primary care and act as that resource, but then take overflow addictions as well too. You need to be comfortable in both uh, areas because the individuals that I'm seeing for primary care are also being seen there for addictions as well. Um, it's quite a busy service to be on. You know, we see upwards of between 60 and 70 patients a day. Uh, that was normally done by one physician, uh, but now uh, me and the physician split that work in addition to me seeing primary care as well. You have to be very open-minded to this type of work. Uh, a lot of the individuals that we see coming in are, you know, stigmatized, don't like accessing healthcare. You know, they've been to emerge for an abscess or some sort of drug-related problem and, you know, they were mistreated or kicked out or, you know, had an outburst because of some sort of intoxication and they don't want to go back. So you see a lot of people who are very down on their luck who, you know, sometimes are very angry and it's not that they're angry at you, they're just, you know, angry at the overall situation that they're in. So you have to work a lot with, you know, an open mind and being very supportive to the individuals and very empathetic as well. The response to the patients has been absolutely amazing. You know, I find that a lot of the people coming in are not, uh, you know, they're never angry or rude or mean towards us. They are actually very happy that we're there because we're a clinic that was specifically put there to, to help them through whatever they're going through. There's lots of different issues between addictions, uh, but also helping people with housing, right? We have people who, you know, their healthcare is so poor, but they're also living at the shelter and getting them out of that environment would actually improve, you know, their, their health status altogether. So we have housing work there. Uh, we have peer support workers that'll help individuals, you know, don't even have a health card. They'll actually walk them down to city hall and get a printed out health card so that they can access services later on. So it's a lot of work that you don't experience in bigger settings because, you know, people coming to, you know, get a surgery or on their gallbladder, you know, might necessarily already have a health card, somewhere to stay, things like that. It's not always the case, but uh, we're able to really help them through kind of the whole picture of things. And how does like the patient flow generally work? Our current company has four clinics in Ottawa. So I work out of the clinic that has the highest volume, which is the Byward Market or downtown. We're close to where all the shelters are. We do have other clinics as well too, but we don't have PAs yet there. Patients will come in for addictions related services. They'll register at the front. If they want us to be seen by the walk-in specialist, they'll specifically come to me and I can do their addictions appointment as well as their primary care at the same time. Or they can come see me at any time as a walk-in service. 
as well. Usually we just take patients off the list one by one. The doctor and I share all of our patients. I'm there Monday to Friday as the resource is there constantly. And then I have two different physicians, one that's there Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, and the other one that's there Monday and Thursday. So it's nice to have that constant individual that's there where, you know, patients can see the same familiar face all the time. So usually I get in by about uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. I usually have some sort of paperwork to fill out, uh, you know, whether it's helping someone register for housing, whether it's helping someone apply for a health card or whether it's consult work. The clinic will usually open up at nine o'clock. Uh, we see a large influx of people at nine o'clock because everyone, everyone likes to, uh, you know, get their appointment done early. Essentially how our clinic is registered is that uh, patients will know which day that they have to come in to get their dosing renewed for their medications, uh, but they can come at any point during that day to walk in. So it's not necessarily appointment based where you're specifically going to come in at 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. or anything like that. We do usually work through lunch just because of all of the patients that we have through, but we do try to take breaks and cover each other when we can. And then the clinic usually for, closes around four o'clock. Typically, how many patients are you seeing in a day? So it depends on the day. So if it's a day that the physician is there physically, usually uh, I will probably see about between 20 and 30 patients. And then same with the physician. Uh, physicians can sometimes go through the appointments a bit quicker just because uh, they've already developed that rapport and I haven't been there for that long. So to me, it's me meeting all the patients for the first time. So I like to, you know, have a chat, see what's important to them and see how I can help them specifically and, and see if they want to access primary care services. We do have had a bunch of days since I started where the physician has been unavailable or couldn't find childcare, had to stay home. And I've seen all of the patients. So, you know, between 60 or 70 patients, just myself and the physician being available by telephone uh, or through Zoom or something, if I had any sort of questions. So it can jump quite a bit between seeing, you know, 20 patients versus seeing like 60 or 70 patients. And are medical directives established for you to have that indirect supervision? Yes, they have medical directives already. They have a PA that's currently working at a, a different center aside from the Addictions Medicine Center in primary care. So what I did was I took those medical directives and I modified them to fit addiction services for the new position that I was starting there in terms of primary care. So it still had to get approved and everything, but uh, we were able to build them quite quickly. And um, what kind of orientation uh, do staff and patients have when they're working with a new provider uh, with a PA that hasn't necessarily been used in this model before? In terms of orientation for myself, I had set orientation, which was scheduled by the owner of the company. So what I would do was, you know, I had days where I can work on establishing the primary care program, and which was more of a paperwork side. And that was just because that hadn't been at that clinic before and they wanted me to build the program from the ground up. But I also had shadow days with the physician and I, so I learned on the spot. At first, I was actually sitting side by side in a chair with the, with the physician to, uh, to see the patients that were coming in. It worked really well for, you know, for two reasons. One being that uh, I wasn't overall comfortable with addictions medicine when I started. I absolutely had never worked in the field before whatsoever. So um, it was helpful to see, you know, how that physician treats patients, how they interact, what types of questions they ask during the patient interview. Eventually, I, you know, separated it into my separate office, and I would start taking patients one by one. Obviously, my appointments would last a bit longer, partly was for my own learning, because I would be asking questions as a physician here and there. And part was for me to develop the rapport with the patients as well. The nursing staff have been really great. Uh, where I work too, where, you know, m many of the patients will come and see nursing prior to their appointment with the physician or the PA. Uh, and if the patient identifies any sort of primary care issue, they'll actually introduce me from the nursing room and then have the patient walk over to my office after with me so I can introduce, you know, how we work and what new services we have. And what are examples of some common conditions that you see? We see absolutely everything. So uh, a lot of it's infection. So I do a lot of cough, cold, just because a lot of people are outdoors, not living in you know, sanitary conditions in the shelters. Um, I see a lot of abscesses. So treating people with cellulitis, treating individuals that have uncontrolled hypertension. I do a lot of regular primary care as well, too. You know, I have people that have come in saying, you know, I've been homeless for two years. I used to have a family doctor. I know I have diabetes and I'll actually manage their diabetes as well, too. From the program that I've built specifically these for these patients, which I find works really well is we don't roster anybody. Uh, but if I have someone that comes in that doesn't have a primary care provider, I will ask them if I can register them for healthcare connect, which is an online service that helps people find family doctors, but I let them know that I will follow them until they find a family doctor. So I follow them for their chronic health conditions ongoing. Um, are there ever any uncommon conditions or weird and unusual things that sometimes walk through the door? All the time. So I had one individual who came in a couple of weeks ago, for example, and he had, said he had an ear infection. So I said, okay, well, you know, did you get seen for your ear infection somewhere? And he said, yeah, you know, I went to one of the uh, urgent care centers in the area. I said, oh, okay, great. Uh, did they do anything for you? And he said, you know, actually I waited in the waiting room for about, you know, six or eight hours. 
And then uh, an individual walked out to the waiting room and said, we don't have time to see you, but here's an antibiotic for your ear. And then uh, sent him off, which, you know, um, unfortunately it does happen quite a bit where, you know, if people are, you know, they don't look very appealing, they're very smelly, they're very dirty, or they're intoxicated, they, they kind of will get shafted a bit in different healthcare settings. So I said, okay, well, you know, how is your ear now? He said, well, uh, it still hurts. So, you know, part of our exam is we have to look into both ears. So I looked in the ear that was infected. It looked to be, you know, not doing too bad, but part of our, you know, uh, maybe just to look in the other ear as well. I looked in the other ear and he actually had a screw lodged in his ear uh, that was going backwards. So all you could see was the head of the screw and he didn't even know what was there. <laughs> so a lot of like strange situations like that. Uh, I've had people come in with completely, uh, you know, terrible wounds, whether, you know, it's a foot that they should have IV antibiotics on where they, you know, got it cut up uh, or an individual with a mental health issue that's, you know, unintentionally harm themselves in some way from trying to treat themselves from an abscess where, you know, they'll come to me and say, I need this, but I refuse to go to the eMERGE. I'm not going to go. So you kind of have to think on your feet, right? You know, how am I going to treat this person so they don't end up losing their foot or, you know, so they don't end up going septic, but they really should be receiving IV antibiotics. So a lot of very complex situations like that. So it sounds like there's a lot of stigma and um, barriers that a lot of the patients that you see tend to face. Any advice for healthcare providers or aspiring PAs about how to approach or communicate with patients that come from very adverse circumstances? Yeah, it's, it's important to, you know, walk into every patient interview with an open mind. You know, someone might be sitting there, hitting their head against the wall, sitting there talking to a TV that's not on, someone who doesn't really seem quite all there that you're really, you know, I don't know if I want to go around this person, but you never know what their background was, right? I constantly see people who, you know, have come in with you know, they're addicted to fentanyl. Fentanyl is a big one on the streets now where, you know, they use, I use about, you know, 200 milligrams of fentanyl a day. I've overdosed about five times. And, you know, part of you in your head is, you know, like, oh my God, like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you hurting yourself this way? Like, and then, you know, once you listen to them, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I've, I've been homeless since I was 13. I had to partner with someone uh, who, you know, was quite questionable just for the ability to survive. Uh, they got me into the drugs. So a lot of people have different circumstances that brought them to where, to where they are. So it's important to, you know, not judge a book by its cover, which is, you know, a common thing to say. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely well said. Everyone has a story that could break your heart. And it's, it's good that you provide a safe space that they can come to you and seek help. With that being said, what do you enjoy about working with this population or working uh, within the center that you are? I really enjoy the patient population that I work with. I think they're absolutely fantastic. You know, it's a lot of people that have come from very, very terrible, rough situations who, you know, looking at them right away, you know, you're like, oh my goodness, you're still in a terrible situation, but you know, it's important to see how far they've come. So I find it's really fulfilling to work with this group of people. Um, It's not my story, but for a physician that I work with told me this story a couple of weeks ago where they said, you know, uh, they had an individual who had been homeless for, you know, 10 years. And, uh, you know, they, we run a program called the Emergency Safe for Supply Program, which is a harm reduction program where we, you know, we'll prescribe people uh, a morphine substitute or a dilaudid, which is a, a higher class of morphine to substitute from the one they're buying on the street just to give them a safer supply so they're not spending their money, they have a less risk of overdose. Uh, it's a program that's, you know, still currently being evaluated. And he said, you know, some individual came into him, you know, a couple weeks ago that he'd been treating for quite a while. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, you know what I did for the first time today, you know, I I was able to walk into the grocery store and I was able to buy a sandwich. So, you know, it's uh, previously because he'd been homeless for so long and spending a lot of, you know, time and money on on illicit substances, you know, he wasn't able to buy his own food. He was stealing from, you know, different grocery stores, uh, going to different food markets just to survive. And, you know, that was a big goal for him is, you know, you know, today I was able to buy a tuna sandwich for the first time in 10 years. So, It's a, you know, it may seem like a small win, but it's a very big win for the patients. And it's very fulfilling to hear that when you're in this type of work. Any challenges that you find, uh, whether it's the patient load or any aspects of the job that you encounter sometimes? Uh, The patient load's quite heavy. Um, That being said, we see every single patient mostly once a week or even twice a week. So you get to know them quite well and you don't have to spend a lot of time documenting and things like that. But the patient load is still definitely very stressful. I find, you know, you're supposed to separate yourself from your patient situation because you're supposed to treat them objectively, just like you treat most patients. But I find with these population, it's very hard not to overinvest yourself. You know, you get very invested in their success and hearing, you know, 
10 heartbreaking stories a day can really get to you in terms of mental health wise. So I find that's a very, you know, hard one to overcome as well too. you know, people who have been through such tough situations who have had no help, but how are somehow, you know, open to opening up to you. It's a, it's, it's rough kind of mental health wise to go through that as well. So what do you do to um, help build resilience and make sure that you are taking care of yourself so you can take care of others? Um, finding ways to decompress after work really helps. Make sure when you go home from your work, you even if it's just for an hour or two before you start thinking about it again, just you know, separate yourself, go read a book, do something you really enjoy. For me, I do kind of really throw myself into my work. So I do spend a lot of time where, you know, if I hear someone with a heartbreaking story and they don't have any access to services, I'll spend a lot of time, you know, improving our program to initiate those services to help them later on. So I find spending a lot of time, you know, working at improving the services so that doesn't happen again type of thing really helps as well. But spending time with doing things you enjoy, uh, especially after work is really important just to give your time, yourself time to recover mental health wise from hearing all those hard stories.